I felt like I was ruining them. If I had to spend all day, every day, with my kids, I would go crazy. I really thought, I am messing it all up. We did not have a very good view of homeschooling families in general. And so we thought we would never do that to our children. A lot of people homeschool because they believe their children would get a better academic opportunity at home. Um, I, for one, was a child who was pretty much always just painfully bored in school. I, I just remember most of school was about how to survive this excruciating boredom. And you couldn't work ahead, you couldn't do anything other than what everybody else was doing. It was like life started when school ended. Hi, I'm Colleen Kessler, and I am a homeschool mom. I'm Sarah McKenzie. I'm Christopher Parent. My name is S.D. Smith. I'm Dr. Carol Swain. I'm Andrew Kern. Andrew Pudewa. I'm Sam Sorbo. Robert Borton. My name is Rod Brown. I'm Mike Smith. My name is Pam Barnhill. Connie Albers. Kathy Cool. My name is Ken Ham. Ron Osborne. Scott Lapierre. Janice Campbell. And we have been homeschooling since the very beginning. Homeschooling today is much different than homeschooling 20, 30, 40 years ago. There are so many co-ops, so many opportunities for kids to interact with other kids. That's what the homeschool journey is about. It's about being there with your kids. It's about learning with your children. It's about teaching them the love of learning. It's about understanding who they are and how God made them and what calling does God have on their life. But recognizing that one of the best ways to help do that today in our particular culture is through homeschooling. Hello, welcome. Hi, Connie. Hey, Yvette, I am super excited to be with you. And let me tell you, that uh, was a phenomenal video clip. I love the music. Well, and, and you're a big part of it. So <laughs> that's also what makes it a phenomenal vi Aww, video clip. Um, so but yes, yes, we are so uh, just blessed to have you as part of the cast of Schoolhouse Rocked. And for those of you who may have missed the beginning of today, we talked about Schoolhouse Rocked. And that's the movie that we are in production on right now, actually in post-production on trying to finish. And so this event, the Homegrown Generation Family Expo, is basically a big fundraiser to bring in the funds that we need to get this movie done and into your hands and into people's hands all across the world. And so we're very, very excited about it. We still have a long way to go, but we're so excited about uh, this movie that the Lord has called our family to make. So, um, so Connie, thank you for being part of Schoolhouse Rocked, the movie, and thank you for being part of the Homegrown Generation Family Expo. Welcome. Oh, thank you. You know, you're doing an amazing work. I loved when we met all those Gosh, I want to say it was just like years ago. It, I don't know how long ago it was, but I love the vision. I love what you're trying to do. I love the message behind uh, Schoolhouse Rocked and the, the film itself. And it's it's you're going to be there. It's going to be there. And it's going to be so powerful when it reaches the market. Well, all, all by God's grace and for his glory. It's nothing that we have done on our own. Um, the Lord has led us to do this. And with the help of the homeschool community, we've gotten this far. So we are so yeah. grateful uh, for you, for the cast members, and for those of you in the homeschool community who have really just, who've prayed for us, who have contributed. Um, many of you have come alongside us and and donated to help get this movie done. And so, and when, and if anyone's interested in knowing more about that, you can go to schoolhouserocked.com and find out more, but we are not here to talk about that. We are here to talk to Connie Albers, who is a master of teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm really excited because I now have a 14 year old. So we are well into our teen years and, and we're loving it so far. It's um, in some ways it's, what I expected it to be. And in other ways, it's much harder than I expected it to be. Um, but it's, there's so much joy 
and having a teenager. And so um, before we get into talking about teenagers, introduce us to yourself and your family, because that really plays into this whole discussion on the teen years. Yes. Well, I've been working with teens for actually about 25 years, a little more than that now. And I kept taking notes. What what were they saying? What what were these kids talking about that they wish they could tell their parents or how their parents would react or the struggles that they were having? Uh, and I, I didn't know it at the time. It's kind of like hindsight's always 2020. If we knew the story God was written, had, was writing, maybe we wouldn't have participated. But I just kept taking notes on what they were saying and thought, hmm, I need to think about this. I need to, how do I articulate to these parents what's really going on in the heart of these kids? And at the same time, I had five teenagers because I'm a mother of five. They're all grown now. And so I would listen to what these kids would say. And I would then listening to my the kids that the words that my own children would say and and see the parallels. And that's when I was kind of like nearing the end of my homeschooling journey and God whispered, I want you to write a book. And I thought, really? So as, as you know, the long, the short story is I ended up writing a book called Parenting Beyond the Rules, Raising Teens with Confidence and Joy. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's now actually available on MP3 and all forms of audio because, oh. you know, if you're a parent of a teen, you're, you're really not probably reading a whole lot, except for what the lesson assignment is for school. <laughs> right. But uh, I'm, I'm overjoyed by the reception of this, uh, largely because I know the impact and the difference that parents have in the lives of their child. And so often society is telling us that, eh, just let them go. They'll figure it out. Quit getting all up in their business. Give them space. I, I just think about all the comments that were told and, and you were torn. Well, what do we do? Do we enter in? Do we push them? Do we pressure them to talk to us? Do we give them this, you know, elusive space that they need? What do we do? And how do we navigate that? And for me, I wanted parents to know that this is a celebration, as you had mentioned with your daughter, of joy, of celebration. It is not a season to be survived. It's it's a season that we're to thrive and watch our children bloom and blossom into the person they're supposed to become. That's right. And and we talked, you know, a lot yesterday about how God created each one of our children on purpose and for a purpose. Yeah. And so it is part of our job really as their parent and as their parents to help our children figure out who they are in Christ, who God made them to be. And so and I know you've done that and and I would really like for you um, I want to answer some questions and stuff, but I would love for you to tell some of the stories of your kids because your kids, you've got five, they're all adults now. And they've all gone in different directions. And you have done such a fantastic job of helping them to learn their God-given gifts and learning how to um, encourage those gifts in them. So can you maybe tell us about a a few of your kids and how you have been able to do that with them? Become a student of your child. I mean, just plain Mm -hmm. and simple. You know, we, we look at what they're good at with math or writing or English or history or science. But what is what are those couple of things that your your child gets lost doing that you're having to say, come on, we've we've got to go or it's time to eat or or we're going to go to you know practice or you have a ball game. And they're so engrossed in what it is that they're doing that they time escapes them. That happens when you become a student of your child. That just takes time. You can't fast forward that. And I would write that down in a book. Literally, I have five kids. So, uh, you know, for me to remember all of that That was was impossible. (laughs) (laughs) It actually is a big book, but I couldn't remember. So I would just kind of jot down what I noticed and observe. So when we become a student of our child, we're really observing. We're observing how, how they care for others or how they process situations. Sometimes they get irritated with a sibling for a specific reason and to like you and I, we'd be like, stop it. They're just, they're just being kids or, you know, they just want to spend time with you. When we study and we know them, we can explain to that child, you know, you, your sibling thinks like this. And every time you do what seems normal and natural to you, it's really irritating to them. So why don't you try this approach? And one of the things I always tell like my own children, instead of do this and don't do that, is I, I tell them, let why don't you consider this? Oh my gosh, consider it? I'm not telling them exactly what to do because they're adult, they're they're young adults, they're children trying to become adults. When I say to them, I invite you to consider, 
Now I've changed the whole dialogue of our conversation. It's not mom or dad mm -hmm. saying, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. It's acknowledging the fact that they are a human. They are in transition of, of growing up. Their thought processes aren't the same, but you're just saying, hey, consider it. And then I follow up with, for these reasons, consider this because you think like this or because you enjoy that or because these situations can usually throw you off. With my own children, you know, I have a, a left brain engineering, math, science kind of whiz. And he was the child that I thought, I mean, well, at the time I thought, wow, he makes me look like I'm a great homeschooler because <laughs> he's just doing so good. And then I had another child. <laughs> she wasn't less smart. She just learned differently. So here, my oldest son, Paul, you know, Mr. Math and Science guy, he just loved it. He, I, I just kept throwing more and more information at him. Jeannie, on the other hand, had to experience everything. I quickly learned during the homeschool years, don't put them together. They're not going to learn alike. They're not going to complement each other. Learning how to get along does not need to be done during read aloud time. It needs to be done when we're setting the table or cleaning the kitchen. Separate that out. The goal is to foster relationships and respect and honor for the person God has made each of you to be, not to necessarily force situations where you just create a lot of stress and havoc that doesn't even need to be there. So I invite you to consider for these reasons. And then that's it. Let it rest. Know when to put your children together and when not to put them together because Paul learns differently than Jeannie. Jeannie has to experience the world around her, give her she needed more space. And I gave it to her. And the more space I could give her, the more she thrived and the more thankful she became at what I was giving her. It's it's great. It's it's great how that works in tandem. Yeah. I think sometimes we have our ideas of what we want our kids to become. And so we try to fit them into our mold. I like that way. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, God has just, he's created them so uniquely. And so I love that you are so intentional about uh, figuring out their own gifts and talents. Let's talk about the teen years, because like I said, we, we have a teen and one who's nine. So she's quickly moving into, you know, those preteen years. Yeah. Um, and I, I really want to talk about some things that I think sometimes are really hard for parents to talk about. And one of those things is just going through this transition of child to preteen to teen and all their hormones are going wacky and they don't know up from down, right from left. I mean, they're just, they get emotional. Not that this is happening in Mine our home at all. That. I'm asking, that? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I um, often say the marvelous, <laughs> mysterious, murky, middle uh, years. It's, they yes. go to bed happy. You tuck them in, you say your prayers and you listen to their secrets and the things uh, that are on their mind. And the next morning you wake up and, or they wake up and you've made them I use this example, you make them French toast, their favorite breakfast, and they walk in the kitchen and they go, <laughs> like, good morning. <laughs> and say, I made your favorite breakfast for you. And they're like, I don't like that. Well, that's your favorite. I made your favorite. I don't like that anymore. And you're like, what happened to that child that I put to bed the night before? Could you go get them? Because somehow they, they disappeared and you know, they woke up a different child. Yeah. But it is true of that, that your child has so much going on from a neurological standpoint. Brain circuitry is developing. The right, the deeper process, deeper thought processes are happening. They're being bombarded by more peer influence and pressure and, and cultural ideals. And they're they're questioning things and they're trying to figure out. And you know, they've got mom and dad going, duh, 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 duh. and sometimes it's wah, wah, wah. And their friends are these all wise, all knowing, you know, they, they know everything. And that does, that, that can happen. But it's a wise parent who can step back and say, I know this is what's happening with this child. And it's going to be different. Every, all five of my kids, as you mentioned earlier, are very different. Some are incredibly sensitive. So when we step back as a wise parent and we try to see through the lens of our child's eyes, that gives us the opportunity to not be the wah, wah. And it gives us the opportunity to say, I realize that you've got this kind of peer pressure because this friend said this and that hurt you. And you're going to be hurt more deeply 
than say your brother or sister who's going to be like, I didn't like them anyway. Um, when you step back and you start to process that way, you handle the middle school years from a different perspective. I know where you're going and I want to paint a picture of possibilities for you. If you consider, and I really want people to write that down. If you consider this, you're giving them permission. You're showing them honor and respect that I know you're not there yet. And I'm not trying to stand over you. Although in two seconds, I could have your problem fixed if you would just let me. <laughs> but no, we're going to go roundabout. Uh, we're going to we're going to go the long way. When we do that event, we're showing them a, such a deeper level of respect and honor that they have been taught well. You have poured into them since they were little. And now they're taking all this knowledge and scripture and character and virtues and it's kind of going down it's got to get to the heart so when they struggle through middle school years and they start to come out and they emerge into the high school years depending on if they're a late bloomer or not your your relationship starts to change and i often say and i wrote this in the book as your child starts to change and adjust we change parenting our parenting style has to change I don't know about you, but my kids called me a world lecturer. I mean, I just, I wanted to make sure I would tell them 15 different ways in, <laughs> in the event that, you know, one of those would seep into that thick skull of theirs. But I quickly learned that that didn't work. I had to speak the words and they had to come out of my mouth in a way that fell into a tender place of their heart. Mm -hmm. So when I invite them to consider what I'm saying and the reasons why they need to consider it, and I say it in a way that's that's through the lens that I know they're going to hear it. Because, you know, honestly, Yvette, I know I'm rambling here, but honestly, if I speak to you the same way I would speak to another friend, you're going to hear it one way and my friend's going to hear it another way. I might offend you and she might be like, Matt, that's just Connie being her again. Well, your kids are the same way, right? So we want to see through the lens of our child. We want to speak in a way that lands in a tender place of our child's heart. And we want to invite them to consider the words that we're speaking. That's a powerful dynamic. Yep. Yep. I think it's, so important to be willing to listen to them. Cause I know oftentimes we feel like, well, we've, we, like you said, we can fix this in two seconds. Let me just tell you how to I do can. it. I can. I mean, right. <laughs> and so it's so good to just take that time to listen to them. And, uh, you know, there's oftentimes where my daughter will talk and, and she'll just come out with something that I'm like, I didn't even know you were feeling that way. And oftentimes it's cause I haven't really taken the time to listen to her heart and to what she's saying. And there's something so amazing about that time, which typically is late at night <laughs> when they want to talk, but when they just open up and just talk about what's on their heart and be willing to just listen to them and just say, okay, well, let's talk through this together. And sometimes it's exciting things and sometimes it's hardships that they're dealing with. And they're just trying to figure out this, this thing called life. And, and I love it. I love this phase of the teen years. Um, it's, it is, like I said, it's easier in some ways and harder in some ways, but it's been, it's been so far a fun ride. Um, you know, as we're looking at going into the high school years next year, my oldest is in eighth grade this year. It's that time where I'm starting to kind of, well, I'm trying to not freak out about the <laughs> high school years. And actually it's not because of the, the teen age years, it's because of high school and all of the responsibility that say, comes all the unknowns. with that. All the unknowns and yeah. the fact that, wow, we only have about four more years with her until, you know, I, I mean, not that I'm ready to kick her to the curb at 18, but you know, at 18, she's going to be an adult and she's 14 now. So we only have a few more years with her. And so how can we really foster that relationship with them as they move in? How, let me reword this. How do we know what still to hold on to as parents and control with that? And I don't mean like manipulative control, but control because we're their parents and God has given us that responsibility. And then how do we know when and how to let go of the things that we need to let go of and allow them to make mistakes and, and to learn how to navigate into this world of the teen years that's quickly taking them into their adult years? Yeah, that's a that's like a great loaded question. So here's the deal. <laughs> I'm going to answer it. And if I fail to answer like 
point A, C, D, or right. E. Did I give you back, too many? Okay. Yeah. No, well, no, no. That no, means no. I have to remember too. <laughs> no, it's such a great question. I want to unpack all of it. Okay. I loved what you said. Uh, actually, that's kind of where most people end up picking up my book. They they realize I've only got so many years. That's it. And and you're right. When you turn the tassel, that doesn't mean you don't have influence anymore. It just means that the the impact that you can have between now and that time is is limited. And we start to see, wow, I know how fast a day or a week or a month goes. So four years, that's going to go by in a, in a blink of an eye. I got to cram all this stuff into her. I got to look at all her weaknesses so I can fix her. So she's ready at 18. The truth is, when we start to step back and we say, you know, I only have this much time, Lord, help me to redeem this time. Help me to be purposeful and intentional. Help me to, as you mentioned earlier, help me to listen, not just to the spoken word. Let me listen to the body language. Let me, let me pay attention to that subtle eye roll or those drop shoulders or the crossed arms or the time where you're asking them something and they don't necessarily look you in the eye. They're, they're looking away. And when we start to, to really tune in and dial in on that and we get very intentional, we start to say, okay, Lord, I, I know the plans that you have. I, I know you have the plans for this child. You have entrusted them to me. They're going to flat. They're going to flounder and flail. They're going to face plant. They're going to make poor decisions. I, I had some who made amazing decisions. And to be honest with you, when I was doing an interview, somebody said, you only mentioned this one child in your book one time. <laughs> I started laughing. I said, I knew exactly you were talking about, because if I would have only had that one child, I would have been writing how to be a perfect parent book <laughs> because I was sure I had it all down pat with this one child, but then he became an adult. And now I heard about the things, you know, he just so quietly hid, but your children being so different, I bet. And when you, when you kind of realize I, I have an objective and I have a time frame. And at the end of this parenting season, as you struggle and you thrash, I want you to know that I love you unconditionally. Regardless, when you make that poor decision, when I hear or see that you've done something that disappoints or grieves my heart, or more importantly, the Lord's heart, I, I'm still going to be there. I'm still going to love you. I'm going to guide you through it. I'm not going to, I'm going to be pivoting and transitioning from the role of, of rules and, and limits and boundaries, which frankly we set. I mean, everybody has a different curfew. It's not written in scripture. Every child should be home by X time. Those are, those are our limits and boundaries and rules. There's that time where you start to know because they start pushing back and you say, where can I adjust on the, on the limits or the rules or the boundaries? Where can I give extended freedom and, re, and re, uh, extended freedom because you're showing greater responsibility? Where do I need to, you said control. Um, I view it as more, we are helping them navigate all the barriers and pitfalls that they frankly can't see. Some children are more astute and more aware, intuitive, and they know, you know, if I do that, I am likely to get in trouble. Others are like, hey, I don't care. The fun's going to outweigh anything that I could ever do, barring like getting kicked out of the house or the car keys taking away. But when we start that transition of letting out the, the reins of control and giving more freedom. Freedom is given when responsibility is handled wisely. Hmm. If you cannot handle the responsibility, then I have to pull back on the freedom, not because I'm controlling you, but because God has asked, God has required that I, that I nurture and protect you and keep you safe. So in the matters of safety, uh, law, rules in, in relations to what is common to all of us, those don't, those don't change. So I'm going to make sure that you are, that those rules are non-changing. If I give you the keys to the car, these are the rules. If you don't want to follow the rules, then okay, fine. No problem on my, you know, I'd love for you to be able to go get groceries for me, but that's fine. If you can't follow the rules, you can't have keys to the car. But there's a lot of areas of that we can give freedom. We can give additional uh, responsibility. Again, freedom is given when the responsibility is handled wisely. When they start to make serious mistakes, they start to make poor decisions, back up and say, you know, I, I want to talk about this. 
I see you doing this. What's the motivation behind it? Are you afraid that your peers are going to make fun of you or ridicule you? Is there something going on in your in your heart that you want to talk about? Has someone been making fun of you? Do you feel I'm coming down on you maybe too hard? Let's talk about our relationship. So often I see parents not willing to be vulnerable themselves. I mean, we're great at laying down. This is what we have to do. So we kind of like go one way or the other. It's like, oh, what, do whatever. Or no, we're going to do it this way. One is fear-based and one is just, I don't know what to do. Therefore, I'm just going to let you go and hope you figure it out. There is this middle ground, this, this give and take where I'm going to let out and then you're going to go and I'm going to let up. And when I see that you are doing well, I'm going to open the boundaries a little more and a little more. And we're going to transition to where I'm guiding you. I'm not forcing, shoving, dragging. Um, but I'm guiding you through this. And that happens because our children know we are their number one cheerleader, that we are there for them. We are there to help them cross the finish line as you know intact as possible um, with as few a mistakes as possible. But frankly, I, I like that our kids make mistakes within the bounds, the confines of our home, because it's through learning those that they're able to make better decisions going further. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. That makes total sense. Yeah. And, and did I, I love answer, like, did I answer all no, that? No, you, you absolutely did. And okay. I, and, and you literally answered it in that one quote that someone actually posted up and I wrote it down here on my notebook. Freedom is given when responsibility is handled wisely. And I love, like, I feel like that should be on a plaque somewhere. Okay. Oh, and, and, hey, and, and, and that. every, it to me. <laughs> that should, well, you should actually just market that. You can just mass produce those and send Thank them to you. every parent in the world who has a teenager <laughs> and just put it above the door of every teen's room, right? Wouldn't that be the greatest thing ever? My mom it. used to tell me when I was a kid, I remember she, and I tell this to my girls, she would always say to me, I will re, I will trust you until you give me reason not to trust you. And she did. And she, you know, she would, I mean, she said that through my childhood, through my teen years. Um, and I tell my girls the same thing. And it's the same exact thing. Freedom is given when responsibility is handled wisely. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we do have to pull back and say, well, you didn't do, you didn't really handle that wisely. So next time you don't have that freedom, but then, you know, maybe a few months down the road, you let up again a little bit. I want to talk about that specific thing in regards to social media, because yes. I know that you are really uh, kind of, you have your hands deep into the world of social media. You're quite knowledgeable about it and really how to handle that with the teen years. And this is something that obviously our parents never dealt with when we were teens. It didn't exist, but now we've got teenagers and they're wanting to get on social media and do all of these things because their friends are doing it. Um, can you t talk about social media when it comes to raising godly children um, to become godly adults, how do we navigate through this messy, messy world without our kids becoming resentful for us to us because we're not allowing them to do what all their friends are doing? So if you guys are wondering, all you listeners out there, and thank you for tuning in, um, I'm taking notes because I have a lot to say on social media. Okay. <laughs> so many people... So many parents are afraid of it and for right and rightfully so pornography is running rampant uh cyberbullying anonymous apps the dark web so much is is dark out there but it is the world your children are growing up in and i can assure you social media is not going away another platform will be developed but it's not going away i mean we saw faith from you know, MySpace to Facebook to Instagram and and now it's TikTok. Here's two things I want your listeners to really understand it and write it down, text it in your phone. But besides food and water, there's two things your children absolutely need to be heard and to be seen. What does social media provide? A place to be heard and a place to be seen. Am I right? Yep. If you wonder your even your shy children that aren't talking to you. They're talking to somebody. Just look at the minutes on their phone or look at the, you know, check out how much time they're spending on Snapchat or whatever platform they're on. This is what I tell parents. Um, and you're right. I'm really involved in it. And I, I, I kind of know more than I wish I would have known. 
but it, it was part of God's design. I, I, I see things on the dark web. I've learned a lot about it and it's, it's gross. You just kind of feel icky. There's a lot of people after our children. There's a lot of people after us, but there is a, there is a way to help your children navigate it wisely by doing this. Helping your children understand it is a tool. It is a resource. It's just like taking an electric drill. You can take an electric drill and go destroy something, or you can take electric drill and create something, correct? Yeah. So it's a tool and a resource. It's not this awful thing. It can be. Help your children learn that they have a voice. They have a platform, especially during the teen years. They, they, they feel voiceless, or a lot of them. And they're looking for somebody. They're looking for their tribe. They're looking for their people. They're looking for somebody that they can connect with. Yeah. Teach them how to have a positive social footprint. I say this all the time. Show them how their voice matters and how they can take their voice, a passion that they're, they're really a, a, a cause they really care about, human trafficking, uh, the pug society, uh, s- rescuing ferrets that are lost after a tornado, whatever it is. <laughs> There's a Facebook group for it, I'm sure. But help them realize, I'm passionate about this cause. How can I lend my time to promoting and shining a positive light and creating awareness within my circle, within my community that promotes a cause that furthers an issue that they're, they care deeply about. That could be, like I said, uh, scripture. It could be about uh, policy, you know, politics, although uh, I kind of stay away from that one, but there are some that love to go there. But if it, it is just a tool it is, it is something that parents can't give their child a device and say, hey, have at it, sweetie. Enjoy TikTok. No, it's a, it's a tool and a resource that we say, like everything, there's warnings with it. There's dangers with it. You know, if you don't use a drill properly, you could drill a hole through your hand. Mm-hmm. But if you use it properly, it could have a huge impact. Talk about being seen and talk about being heard. Use examples from from platforms where you see they're just trying to take the big old flashlight and say, look at me, look at me. Aren't I wonderful? I'm so special. I and, you know, and I'm just doing all these crazy, crazy things. (laughs) Say, you know what? Let's take that same device and let's shine a light on caring for pets or taking care of of an elderly person or you know, a, a disease that cancer or something like that. So many children, when they learn this, they grow up into adulthood and they understand the power of commerce, starting a business, creating awareness. And why do I say that? Well, now my children are all adults. Three of them have online businesses. They use social media responsibly. They, they're they careful in the words that they use. They're they're, they shine a light on things that, that are passionate and that matter to them. They've learned how to promote other people instead of just, hey, I'm so wonderful. Look at this outfit today. They shine a light on the things that matter most. And that's really what we want. If we don't do it and help them during the teen, tween years, when they hit 18, they go berserk. I've seen it so many times. They get on college campuses or they they get out into the adult world and they have really just gone crazy with all kinds of things that you would rather them not do on social media. The other thing is when you teach them to use social media wisely, they can see that, oh, a college is looking at my social media footprint. Mm. My, my employer. Right. They are watching what I'm posting and where I am on Friday when I'm supposed to be at work, but they see I'm posting pictures of me at the beach. Hmm, no wonder I just got fired. (laughs) We teach them to have a positive social footprint, knowing that we are leaving a, 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 a trail of what matters to us, what we believe in, and who our circle of friends uh, who our circle of friends are, that is powerful. That will impact them for the rest of their life. I yes, and I totally agree, and I love that side of it because any platform that God gives to any of us, we can find ways to use it for His glory. Yeah. My other question on the other side is then, if we're going to allow them to use social media to have a positive um, social footprint, which absolutely we should do that, 
how do we protect them from the things that are to come? We, you know, back in the summertime, we, you know, our family travels a lot. And so we're always away from friends wherever we are. And so uh, back in the summertime, we were actually in California visiting uh, family and friends there. And Brooklyn had been asking to get Instagram because some of her friends had some Instagram accounts. So Garrett said, okay, well, we'll allow you to get Instagram. However, it's going to be linked to my phone and to your phone. And so he would have access, of course, to everything that she was, you know, posting on there, people who are posting on hers. We were very, he, I mean, he really tightened down um, the notch on who had access to her Instagram. And one night I just, I went on her phone and all, and, and it wasn't any, anything she had been looking at at all, but you know, Instagram, when you go to the homepage, it came up with a horrific, I mean, just the pictures were horrific. And, and I, I, I screen captured some of them cause I couldn't even believe them. And, and so anyway, the next day Instagram was off of her phone and she was so upset cause she said, well, I haven't looked at any of those. I said, I know you haven't, but you still have access to them and you will see them even if it's accidentally, I know you're not going to go looking for them. Um, but I know so many kids can get caught in that trap without even intentionally, they don't even know that they're getting caught in a trap until they see something and go, Oh, Oh, what's that? Um, so how do we allow them to be engaged with social media in a safe way to where they're not going to be exposed to things that are going to be harmful to them? You know, many of the executives with all of these platforms, I even had a meeting with some folks at Google and asked them, you know, they had teenagers, what do they allow? And, you know, they're like, well, we don't allow very much because they understand all the loopholes. Well, yeah. that's the truth. Your kids the kids know all the loopholes. You put a password, you lock something down and two seconds later, they're going to crack the code. They're, they're just brilliant like that. They understand it. We have to remember it all starts with one click. So mm -hmm. that, that one little vision can turn into two or three or four. So Yvette, in the case of Brooklyn, uh, your daughter, I'm so sorry. In the case of your daughter, it, it's basically sweetie, it's God says this, we are to look on what sort of things are good, what sort of things are lovely, what sort of things of good report, look on those things, think on those things. Sure. Be careful what you put before your eyes. It's not that Brooklyn, we don't trust you. It's that we know what others are, are trying right. to get into you. We can, we can get filters. There's, there's different uh, companies out there that put parental filters on there. I've seen all of that. And the minute you put those devices on lockdown, your kids just find other ways where the heart wants to go. It's going to go. Mm -hmm. So it all comes back to the heart because the cousin might not be on lockdown. The neighbor yeah. might not be on right. lockdown. Yep. Uh, I've had, I've had kids. I've had parents tell me their kids go in their bedroom while their parents are sleeping and they pull the phones out from the drawer where they know their parents mm. have them. They break into the password. They've spent time on social media. They slip it back in before the parents wake up in the next morning. Yeah. So where your child's heart wants to go comes back to knowing your child and keeping the heart of your teen, which goes back to knowing having their relationship. They, they might stumble and, and, and we, and we certainly don't want that, but walking them through the dangers and the pitfalls and saying, I'm not doing this because I want to deprive you from connecting with your friends. My first responsibility is to answer to a holy God who mm -hmm. says, I have given you children, these children to teach and train in the way they should go. You are the first line of protection. So do your job mom and dad stand yeah. in that gap. They might not like it, but when they know it's not that you're a perpetual killjoy or that you're just, they're never going to talk to anybody. Right. You're saying, I see this is happening. I want to guard you and protect you in as much as possible so that you can wisely make the decisions. And I don't want you to sneak around. You know, I may not know what you do. I would tell my kids this all the time. I, I don't have eyes in the back of my head, but I have a holy God who has eyes everywhere. So yeah. that trumps the eyes in the back of my head. Right. I may not know what you see or do, but I can promise you the Lord will see. And he has this uncanny ability to let mom and dad find out. Yeah. And that's never fun. And that's never pleasant. But I do recommend knowing the child and, and some children are easily addicted to social media because why they want to be known. They want to be heard. They want to be seen. 
Some children could care less. If your child is insecure, they're going to be more tender toward those comments of, of comparison. Whereas children that, that don't wrestle with self-confidence issues, maybe those are the children that you wish, you know, they weren't quite as confident as they were. But it all comes back to knowing the child and knowing what their propensity is, which goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. Be a student of your child. Mm -hmm. Observe where their tendencies, where their, their feet run. What are they searching for and longing for? And then how can you provide those in a way that is good and beneficial and, and needful to their soul. Does that make yeah, sense? It totally does. And I just want to clarify, she hadn't been looking at anything, <laughs> you know, oh, it, yeah, was, yeah. I, it, I, it was kind of weird. It came on late at night and, and, and I don't know if Instagram does that intentionally. I mean, it was long after she'd gone to bed and anyway, um, we totally trusted her. We didn't trust Instagram. That was the thing. And so and you're right. We, and we so, shut yeah, it I down. Mm -hmm. um, but but you're right. I mean, it doesn't matter where they go. You know, kids at church have cell phones and you don't know what they're exposing our kids to. And, you know, we cannot keep our kids in a bubble all the time. But I love that you're talking about, you know, having that open dialogue with them. And that's one thing that we have with our girls. And, and I've told them since they were teeny tiny, if you ever come across anything that is inappropriate, or that you feel in your heart is inappropriate because you can feel it. You know what's inappropriate. You come to me and you or go to daddy and you talk to us about it and we will pray with you. And I've, you know, I've had both of my girls on different occasions come to me and say, mom, I didn't mean to see this. You know, something will flash up on the TV and uh, um, something will flash up on the TV and that they just walked into a room innocently. They had no idea what was going on. And, um, and so they are exposed to these things. And so, Anyway, it's it's an unfortunate time to live in history. I wish that yeah. we didn't have to expose our kids to these things. Well, we don't expose them. I wish that our kids weren't exposed to these things, but they are. Um, and so, yes, I think having that that honest, open dialogue with them and allowing them to come to us with anything and us not freaking out about it as their parents, you know, oh my goodness, what did you just see? You've ruined my uh, life. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I want to say one thing that sure. when, when our children do see something uh, on purpose or indirectly. Uh, my children were exposed to so much when they were with their friends and everybody mm -hmm. had their devices. The, the rules, the standards, the values that you hold, uh, the cousins might not hold. Right. Or, you know, the, even the friends, like my kids all play, you know, sports. Even the other kids on the Christian basketball team didn't all hold the same standards. Right. And they saw a lot of stuff. And, and one of the things that I have learned and my kids have kind of shared with me is that we didn't shame them and yeah. guilt them, uh, right. either whether they clicked on it themselves or whether they stared at something just maybe a little too much or, you know, piqued that curiosity. We don't want to make them feel dirty. We don't want to make them feel guilty or shamed. We want them to get wiser so that doesn't happen in the future. And when something does happen, they know how to navigate and, and pivot away from that to avoid it. Does that make right. sense? Yes, totally. Yeah. And I'm sure you did that with your daughter. Oh, sure. But parents often, they don't know what to do. And, and our first reaction is, we're just getting rid of all of it because I really don't know what to do with it. So when we take the time to teach our children, there is a purpose and a, a place for it that they have a voice, that they can use that voice to create a positive social footprint, mm -hmm. create awareness, bring others on board, shine a light on the things that are going to make a, an impact in their, in their local neighborhood even. They feel as if they are heard and seen and they can express themselves. And, and that just takes you and I getting down in there and paying attention. Yep. Yep. Well, and I loved how earlier you talked about how it really is an issue of the heart, because if we are really helping our children to grow in their knowledge and understanding of the Lord, which again, you know, is it, that is our responsibility as their parents is to teach them the ways of the Lord and to yeah. just, you know, pour scripture over them and teach them the, the word of God. If they know that, then, you know, hopefully they will have that prompting of the Holy spirit and they will feel, um, they'll feel that conviction, you know, if, e even if it's not anything they've done wrong, if they're, if they just come across something and they know it's not something that's right, they'll feel that, oh, I'm not supposed to see that. 
and walk away from it. And so that's yeah. really, you know, the the greatest hope is that they will have the prompting and that they'll listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When we he want them to tells be them sensitive to, to his stirring. Right. Right. Because after they're out of our home, you know, we're not there to protect them. Uh, you know, they're still going to have access to all, all sorts of things. It reminds me of that song that we used to teach them. Be careful what you, oh, be careful little ears, what you hear. Yes. Be careful little <laughs> eyes, what you see. Right. You know, that's exactly, I mean, that just kind of like goes throughout all of yeah. life. We just don't put the cute little sound to it, but it's still yes. the truth. Guard your, guard your eyes, guard your heart with all diligence. Yes, that is right. Okay. Let's, let's take a little turn in this whole world of homeschooling. And I want to talk about homeschooling, um, and like practically through the teen years, because I know oftentimes we don't feel like we are equipped. We basically, most moms don't feel like they're well enough equipped to teach, you know, even up to the junior high years. And then we get into the high school years. And unless you are a master in every subject, which pretty much no one is, you know, you don't have a historian and a mathematician and a scientist and, you know, an artist and all these things in every family. Um, you know, mom can't be all those things. We feel like, well, we might be strong in one area, but these other areas, I'm just not equipped to teach these. So how did you work through those years with your kids? Because, you know, you're, you're, you're a smart lady, Connie, I've met you, but you probably weren't a master of every single subject you taught your kids in high school. So how did you get through those years? And how can you build confidence into these parents to just stay the course through the, the high school years? You have to remember uh, what your children need. They need you to remain steadfast during these years. That doesn't mean that you the rules are are exactly the same that you can't adjust and pivot, but it means that that they need you to to identify in them areas of giftedness and areas of weakness. What happens when we uh, ask our children? Uh, so, what's your favorite subject? And they'll tell us, I don't know. What's your least favorite subject? And they'll say, math history, science, it, we can go to the default of what we can't do and, and easy, easy. I mean, we get three A's and one B and it's, why did you get a B instead of, Hey, you got three A's. So how did I navigate high school with all five children? I understood how they learned because I paid attention. I knew one child, I could just give nothing but textbooks and research projects and a to-do list. And that's, I could send that child on their happy little way. I knew another child how to experience it, taste it, feel it. Took that child a lot longer in a school day to be able to accomplish what they needed to accomplish. But the end of it, they would accomplish, they would still learn it. Tailor the education to the needs of the child. Look for what you see that giftingness is in that child, whether it's they have a propensity for math and science, load them up with math and science. And that just means that you're not going to spend as much time on art. Doesn't mean art doesn't matter because I have an artist who's doing phenomenally well. It just means that particular child, I, I knew she probably wasn't going to go in science. And this is my daughter, Jeannie. I knew she wasn't going to go in science uh, like an engineer, like her brother, but she needed to understand geometry. She needed to understand physics. She, under, she needed to understand lighting and scope and, and all of those things. And she needed to be able to tell a story. So for Jeannie's education, I focused on time and space and creating. I think it's Pablo, De Ca uh, Pablo Picasso. Did I get that right? I yeah. think so. <laughs> he basically said every child is born creative. It's up to us to keep them that way. Hmm. I focused on that early on. I wanted to keep the creativity and the innovative and, and, and I can't speak today. I wanted them to be innovative. I wanted to be explorers. So I wanted Paul and I'll use their names, but I wanted Paul to explore the worlds of math and science and, and quantum physics and, <laughs> calculus. I didn't know calculus and I didn't know physics and I didn't need it. Jeannie needed to understand what she needed to understand. Paul, Tyler needed to understand filmmaking and storytelling and cinematography and various things like that. So I specifically in the eighth grade, because you wanted nuts and bolts and the seventh and eighth grade, I sat down with that, you know, book I told you I had been paying attention to. Uh-huh. And I looked and I started planting seeds of possibilities within each child. You know, Paul, I noticed this about you. You might want to consider this field. Jeannie, I noticed that when I come back from a homeschool conference, my the most favorite thing about me coming home is the bag that I bring you from Miller Pad and Paper. Thanks for the um, just free endorsement there. 
<laughs> she was going to get color pencils and 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 crap and scrapbooks and and things of the like. That was her favorite thing. I would I would say, you know, you may want to consider this field. Tyler, you may want to consider this field. Jacqueline, you love to create food. You love to to make your plate look beautiful or create all these fancy recipes. Jonathan, you could talk till the sun comes home. You could you it goes down. You could you could argue with a bush. Uh, you are so persuasive, not manipulative. You're persuasive. Why? We're going to watch the words. The words that are going to come out of our mouth are going to land into a tender place of our heart because we're going to see through the eyes of our child, right? John, you, I see this in you. You might want to consider this. Then we start mapping out a plan. All right, you're going to need this by the time we turn the tassel. So let's work backwards. Paul, you're going to need these courses. Jeannie, you're going to need these courses. Tyler, you're going to need these courses. Jacqueline, you're going to need these courses. These, not everybody got the same education. They all got a phenomenal education, but it was tailored to how they learned, what they were interested in, and the path that they were going to take. Which you may, your next question, Yvette, if depending on time, maybe, but how did you know that? <laughs> well, some of it is you you try and they go, I I really don't like this. My daughter wanted to be a veterinarian. I mean, she just, she wanted, she thought, she thought, it, well, actually, she wanted to be a marine biologist. She thought a marine biologist swam with dolphins all day long. Then she met a friend of mine who was a marine biologist and she said, no, you got to like do dissection. She's like, mm, not going to do that. I love pets too much. <laughs> And so she pursued something else. So don't be afraid to try and don't be afraid to pivot. As a parent and as a homeschool mom of teens and high schoolers, you've got to master the art of the pivot. So listeners, please write that down. Master the art of the pivot. It's okay for you to lay that down. It's okay for you to say, I thought this was going to work, but it's not. So we're going to change Honey, let's consider using this. Let's consider not going in this direction because I see you constantly get drained of energy or sucked out of, uh, like the life gets sucked out of you. Let's, let's try this. What do you think about that? Do you hear how my words make them go like this? Yeah. So I always try to get them, I always tried to frame a question that as I was saying it, they'd be going like this and... Uh, they didn't necessarily want to do that, but they couldn't help because <laughs> I'm inviting them into this dialogue and this conversation. And they see that at the end, when I turn the tassel, I'm not going with them beyond that point. The only point I'm going with them is in our relationship. But those decisions are all going to be there. So be thinking about the specific things that I had mentioned. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. And one of the things that I've really come to realize, partly through talking to you and, and many other moms who have gone before me on this homeschool journey, is that God has created each one of our kids with, with certain abilities. He has not created every single one of them to master every subject. And we, we talked about that. But you know, our, we have this idea that when our kids go to school, they have to ace everything. They have to ace history, science, math, you know, geography, art, everything. They have to do it all perfectly because in our world of school, an A means that you have mastered it and perfected it. But but God didn't create every one of our children to be a historian and a scientist and an artist and a mathematician. He created them all, all of us differently. And so, you know, we we tell our girls all the time, you don't have to know it, you know, all the way. You just have to understand enough science to understand your creator and enough history to understand the history of God's world and enough math to, you know, go grocery shopping and, and get through life, but they don't have to master everything. And so I, for myself, that has taken a huge, I think, burden off of me feeling like, well, by the time my girls get in, get to their 12th grade year, they have to have perfected every single subject I've put in front of them. They really don't. Um, they need to do their best, certainly. And you know, we've got state standards and we have to abide by those. And I get that. But they don't have to get straight A's all the way through, ace everything and do it all perfectly in order to be deemed successful because that's not how God created us to be. So so I love that. Um, one of one of the um, questions is asking if you can talk more about your book. So, oh. um, so yes, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's a fantastic book, Parenting Beyond the Rules. And uh, we actually, you and I did a podcast on this 
Oh, we did. It was probably a year ago, right? It, it's <laughs> yeah. been, a, I can't believe it's been out that long. But um, so you can go back and listen to the podcast. But um, for now, yes, let's, can, can we, do you have it in front of you, Connie? Can we kind of breeze? Do I have that book in front do of me? Do you happen to have your book in front of you? <laughs> I just have I just happen to have a whole stack. Nice. <laughs> if I'm only you could hand them out. Is right. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I wish I wasn't so washed out. I did put makeup on today just for you guys. Oh, you look great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want to talk about the book. I want to just address one thing. Sure. People, and it kind of goes back to what you just said. No, our children aren't going to be masters of everything, but we want to teach that they master the things that they are that they are learning, right? We want to help them manage those weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Sure. We want to help them excel in their strengths. And how does that relate? I know we're, I got to be quick. No, you're okay. We're good. All, all five of the kids went on to college on academic scholarship. And I get asked, how did you do that? You had an artist and you had an engineer and you had a filmmaker and a hospitality person, not making fun of hospitality, but hospitality is kind of like that. Uh, And you had a communications guy. How did you do that? Well, I learned, I taught them how to master their strengths Mm -hmm. and then how to manage their weaknesses. So you're not really good in like calculus. You struggle in geometry. You excel in writing. All right here's what we're going to do on those standardized tests, whatever, you know, you, the hoops that you have to jump through, we're going to zero in and we're going to focus. And I'm going to help you see where you stumble and where you excel. And when that happens, they're able to, to, you know, master those tests and get into their school. How do they get through school? Well, again, they know where their strengths are. They know where to go when they hit a when they hit a pitfall and they know what to do when those weaknesses are creeping up on them and overwhelming them. So I I just wanted to follow up with that. Now, back to the book, of course, I love it. Uh, All the five paintbrushes represent my children. There's a story to this paintbrush because our lives are story. And what you and Garrett are doing with the girls is you're writing a story that uh, will one day be be told uh, by your children and your grandchildren. And this is hold that book back up again sure. uh, because what's so important about this book is your child is a masterpiece in the making and God is the architect. He knows what that painting is supposed to look like. And he has asked you mom and dad to help paint that picture. If you'll notice there's five different paintbrushes with mm-hmm. five different colors and five different se- and five different <laughs> uh, shapes. Why? Yeah. Because not every brush stroke will work. Yeah. Not every color is going to be in the masterpiece of your child's uh, final painting. And that's what I want parents to do is paint a picture of possibilities of what their child can do and how we as a family, and I always talk about a family unit, we are the Albers, Albers in action. And they'll tell you to this day, they'll laugh now. Oh, we are the Albers. That's okay. I don't care. Now they think it's like a badge of honor. Um, (laughs) There's power in being part of a family. Yeah. And they know that. And they know that I was not trying to create a bunch of mini me's. I am in a family of all introverts and I'm the extrovert. So I drive them all crazy. (laughs) But God is the architect. When you seek him and you say, God, I need the colors of grace and forgiveness. I need to, to add a little bit more character training over here to this area, to this child that maybe doesn't tell me the truth all the time, or maybe is a little secretive. I need to see what is missing so that I can add just a few touches here or there, whether that's listening, that's monitoring your mouth. It's maybe even starving your own fear. I talk about squashing the fear. Sometimes we have a hard time parenting or homeschooling because we're afraid, afraid that uh, what others will think, afraid our children will reject us or our values, afraid uh, peer pressure, afraid uh, that we're going to fail or that our children are going to embarrass us. We have to squash that fear. We have to understand our child's world. It's very, very different. We talked about it with social media, but just beyond social media, their world is different. They're, what they used to read about a famine in a history book, they now just check out on Twitter when they go to news twi- twend- twending. How about Twitter twending? <laughs> um, 
they go to trending, your children can see live action, that tsunami that's wiping out people. They can see the NASCAR accident, whether you have a television or not. Understanding the world that we're living them and then engaging in that world and not being afraid to enter in and have those conversations and not being afraid to talk about tough topics. Yeah. They're prevalent in our children's ages. They're, they don't know what to think about some of this stuff that they hear. Is mom and dad just a prude? Uh, is mom and dad really know what they're doing? Or are, are we, you know, just not with it? No. When they know that we are engaging with them and that we're listening to them and that we're starving our own fear and that we're having those hard conversations, that our family is a unit, that we're going to do life together not just homeschooling, because you turn the tassel. There's right. so much more than homeschooling. There's life beyond that. I want my kids to call me on Thanksgiving and say, hey, mom, what time is dinner? I don't want. You are coming for Thanksgiving, right? Who wants that? Yeah. I wanted this. What can I bring? I wanted my children want to be around when they didn't have to be around. I wanted them to call me and say, you want to go get lunch? When they could go with a friend. Yeah. That's what I want to do. And that's the goal of parenting beyond the rules. I want the parents to have confidence and joy in knowing that these are God's children, that he has faithfully asked you to show up every day and, and build that family and that building your family is your life's greatest work. That's the, that's the thing that matters to the Lord. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I love your, um, commitment to your relationship with your kids. And one of the things that you have done with your kids, and, and we'll get to um, a couple of these questions here. Um, but I wanted to say real quick, one of the things that you did with your kids was that you opened up your home, you were very hospitable to your kids and to their friends. And so you would allow them to bring their kids their you would allow your kids to bring their friends over anytime just to hang out. Um, and so then you had relationships with their friends as well. And and I think that's so important. So oftentimes, you know, we're like, well, our house is a mess or we don't have, you know, enough food or we don't have a big enough house or whatever. So we can't, your friends can't come over. Why don't you go to your friend's house? And, um, and, you know, I love that your home was just the home that was welcoming and open and you allowed your kids and their friends to just make that home. And we've told our girls that, you know, well, we're, we're in a wonky home situation right now because we're still doing the traveling thing. But when we have a house again, um, you know, we've told our girls, you know, you, your home is as much your home as it is our home. So yeah. when you want to have friends over, we've given them free, free reign. If you want to have your friends over, call me up and say, Hey mom, I'm bringing over so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and the answer is going to be yes. And, um, cause it should be a place of, of walking. It doesn't belong to us. It's not our house. It belongs to the Lord anyway. And so make it a place of ministry. Um, so I, I want, so the name of the book, Natalie is it's called parenting beyond the rules and it's raising teens with confidence and joy by Connie Albers. And it's an excellent book. You guys definitely want to get, I saw in here that someone already, already purchased it. Thank you. Um, so here's a question. It says, can you talk about recognizing a difference in maturity versus age as parents determine when it's appropriate to slow, uh, to slow kids access to the world through uh, media and social media? Oh, what a great question. We actually had that. My, one of my sons actually said, I want to, I should be able to do this. And I'm like, why? Well, because I'm 17. I'm like, great. You've reached a number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it is. Uh, but that's a great question. How, when you're determining maturity, it's really how are they handling the responsibility? Are they making wise decisions when you give them that? If you tell them, for instance, you are going to be able, let's say you have an older teen and they want to take the car and you say, all right, this is, these are, these are the parameters we're going to put on you being able to take the car. You've got to be back by this time. You have to have this. You can't have people in the car, you know, whatever those things are. And they come home. And you find out because you maybe check the odometer, which I have been known to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and now we would just do fine friends. But when they would ask for specific extra freedoms or they felt the curfew was unfair or they felt that they should be given more video time. I had a kid. I had some kids that really love video games. They should be given more time. I would literally ask them, why? Why? 
Why are you wanting this? What, for what purpose is there? Is there somebody you're trying to connect with? Is there a level you're trying to achieve? Are, are you afraid you're missing out on something? Tell me, tell me why. And then if I give this to you, how do you, how do you anticipate managing that freedom? Again, what did I just do? I, I didn't, I just put it all back on them. Mm -hmm. and, and if they mess up, then I can come back and say, you know, we talked about this and in, you said that you were in agreement with X, Y, Z, and I'm so sorry. I, I really am sorry. And I mean it. I'm really sorry that you didn't manage that well, because that just means you, you're not ready for that. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to pull back on that for now. And we'll revisit it in a couple months. When you think that you can handle that specific freedom or that you are able to be around the certain group of people without it negatively influencing you, then let's have that conversation again. Let's sit down. I talk about this in the book about having family meetings. Children want to be, they want to be heard. They want to be seen. Mom and dad, they want to know that you hear them, not just the request, but you really hear what's going on in their heart, whether that's a, a loneliness that they're feeling and they need to feel connected with a peer group or, you know, a competition type thing where they need to be out doing something that's competitive. So uh, show them the path to achieving what it is they're hoping to acquire. Yeah. And then let them shoot for it. Yeah. Some and of them will hit that. it. Some will miss it. Yep. And that's okay. Um, okay. We've got time for one more quick okay. question. And um, let's see, Christy is asking, what are, what are the tests you recommend middle schoolers to take for finding their strengths and interests? Is there uh, a test for that? Yeah, there actually, there's several and I'm a, I'm an assessment wonky. <laughs> strengths Explorer uh, is a great one. It's for ages 10 through 14. Okay. It's, it's not the same thing as the former. It used to be called Strength Finders and now it's called Clifton Strengths. But it's called Strengths Explore. It's for ages 10 to 14. What I love about that, instead of going to the whole 34 themes, it breaks it into little buckets. Like you, you seem to have this propensity toward communication or research or, you know, those types of things. And then it helps them to see, this is why I ask so many questions. This is why I'm so inquisitive. This is why I always get in trouble for reading books. I'm, I'm hungry for knowledge because I'm a researcher and I'm, you know, I'm going to solve uh, cancer, the problem, you know, I'm going to come up with a cure for cancer one day. I love, I love that one. The other one is the five love, five love languages for teenagers. Yeah. We all give and love receive, we all give and receive love differently. Knowing how your child receives love kind of goes back to seeing through the lens of your child. What you say may not be what they hear, but mm -hmm. when you understand who they are, you're able to speak in a way that they can grasp and lock onto. And they start to feel like she gets me. There's just nothing better than yep. feeling somebody knows me. Uh, those are two that I highly recommend. Okay. And then someone's asking, um, Katie's asking, is there one for high school? Well, the high school, yes. I, I like Strengths Quest. It's okay. kind of like a college assessment. I like Strengths Quest. Uh, the Myers Briggs is also a good one. Uh, it does help. I am so careful, though, on some of these. I, I always be with your child when you do it. And for this reason, they may not understand a vocabulary uh, word or the idea of it. They may struggle if you have a certain child who wrestles with insecurity with the whole always, never. Well, I'm not always a never. I'm just going to go <laughs> like in the middle of the road. Walk them through it and then be take the time to explain it well to them. Don't let them self-label because they could inappropriate, they could wrongly label themselves and believe something that's not accurate about them for years mm -hmm. until they're into their twenties. They're going, huh, I'm really not like that. Yeah. So be careful of them. A lot of times you can do them. I have a whole book of my kids of uh, different assessments. Use it as an opportunity for you to know them better and to speak possibilities and thoughts to them in a way that they can ingest and, 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 and it can make sense to them. Yeah. Great. And, and Christy, I see that you're popping those up there. Thank you for putting those thank up for you. others to see. So, um, Connie, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your wisdom and, um, just for all that you have done to help support the ministry of schoolhouse rocked and to help support the homeschool community. Cause you have done that and you're, you're speaking at a few conventions this year, correct? 
I you'll am be, um, multiple conventions. I am. My interview just released last week with Focus on the Family. Oh, uh, fun. Fabulous. Nice. Um, I am going to be speaking. Yes. Why did my, my brain just went. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, but I, I will be in Indiana next month. So I know okay. that for sure. And I do will you have a list on your others. website? Uh, I think I do at ConnieAlbers.com. ConnieAlbers.com. Okay. So yeah. you guys get Parenting Beyond the Rules, Connie's book. And then uh, go to ConnieAlbers.com and you can learn more about Connie. Um, thank you, Connie, for your wisdom today. And thank you guys for engaging. It's so much fun to see your comments and questions popping up. And don't forget, we still have lots and lots every day for the rest of this week, lots of contest giveaways. There is so much good stuff. So make sure that you are entering to win those contests. Make sure that you're sharing this event with your friends uh, because we still have three and a half days of amazing sessions for you guys to enjoy and to encourage you in your homeschool journey. So thank you. Have a fantastic rest of your day, Connie. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you guys back here with Linda Hobar from the Mystery of History in about 20 minutes. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Connie.